A warm welcome to everyone to our webinar, Climate Responsible Finance, a moral imperative towards children. Just a few points on technicalities. This webinar is being recorded. Also, if I may ask you all to please mute yourself when you are not speaking. And finally, I encourage you all to share in the chat box who you are and where you're from. Now, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Reverend Professor Dr. Johan Sauker, our World Council of Churches Acting General Secretary. Over to you, Father Johan. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Excellencies, distinguished participants. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, co-hosted by the WCC and UNEP, and organized by the Church's Commitments to Children program. This is an important milestone for the implementation of the statement launched on 9th of May climate responsible finance, a moral imperative towards children. We are delighted to have you with us today, lead experts on what it takes for the world remains inhabitable for future generations. By joining this webinar, you are giving a strong signal of hope to all. By joining this initiative, you are using your influence to accelerate the most powerful actions for climate solutions. Thank you so much and best wishes for an impactful webinar. Thank you very much, Father Yuan. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Iyad Amumogli who is the founder and director of the United Nations Environment Program Faith for Earth Initiative. Over to you, Iyad. Thank you very much, Frederick. Uh, Reverend Professor Dr. Ioan Sauka, Acting General Secretary of the World Council of Churches, your eminences, friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me a great pleasure today uh, to represent the United Nations Environment Program in this important meeting, celebrating the joint launch of the appeal for climate responsible finance as a moral imperative towards children. The appeal says, we affirm our commitment to engaging with the financial institutions through which we bank, invest, and seek insurance coverage to ensure that our financial dealings are aligned with the Paris Agreement. This appeal comes in a critical moment when the world is facing unprecedented environmental crises. It is the responsibility of, all, of everyone to curb the impact of these global challenges and strive for sustainable ways of living to protect both people and planet. This requires rethinking how we conduct our financial practices and economic behavior to ensure greater environmental consideration. Faith actors can be part of the green transition and help realize the sustainable development goals and agenda 2030. Faith institutions have great investment capabilities and their active participation is essential to finance sustainable development. In 1992, UNEP released the statement of commitment by financial institutions on sustainable development, recognizing the role of the financial services sector in making our economy and lifestyle sustainable. Hence, UNEP established the UN Environment uh, Finance Initiative, uh, UNFPI, which we will hear more about. Faith actors can drive sustainable financial practices, not just at the institutional or organizational level, but equally at the individual level through advocating on such matters among their adherents. Faith, ethics, and values permeate into all areas of life. This includes perspectives on work, money, wealth, charity, and duties of care. In Christianity, for example, God does not con condone 
condone those who benefit from their money and spend it on themselves and their loved ones as long as they avoid causing harm. Muslims believe that everything belongs to and originates from God. Thus, wealth must be utilized in a responsible way that reflects his teachings. The Torah offers guidance on aligning capital with Jewish values through a number of commandments, such as mitzvot, the Hebrew word for good deeds, and the concept of tikum ulam, repair the world. In other religions, there are similar principles. So all religions are united in the call for the moral use of financial resources that benefit the people and the planet. Faith and finance have always been interconnected. Faith groups have always attempted to guide believers towards various forms of spiritual enlightenment and to do good deeds, whilst urging them to keep away from temptations created by wealth and greed. I look forward to an inspiring and informative webinar today. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you so much for suggesting that we organize this webinar. Despite lack of time and resources, in light of the alarming news by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we decided to organize this event now and not later this year. Because we are at a crossroads and we have to take the right path. Because every minute counts. Because we care about children. So here is what our program look like, looks like for today. We first look more deeply at the challenge, what the IPCC tells us, what this means for children, and the role of the finance sector. Then we will have a session on solutions with many testimonials on what works. We will then have an opportunity to build on the collective wisdom of everyone present in this webinar in an open panel of part three of this event. There will be time for questions after each of these parts. Therefore, you are invited to please write your questions in the chat box during the presentations so that we may address them in the dedicated slot. Over to you, Ia, for our first session. Thank you very much, uh, Frederic. And um, again, I'm delighted to uh, be with you today and co-moderate with Frederic this important webinar. So the title of this session is Be Challenged. And as the world continues to work towards the achievement of the SDGs by 2030, the integration of religious actors and religious diversity of values within the current sustainable development paradigm informed by modern science is necessary for the requisite systemic shifts in uh, human behavior. Religious teachings mainly depend on religious scriptures as the reference in calling for action. However, in recent years, many religious statements have referred to the scientific evidence provided by scientific studies and international reports. Science is clear about climate change. This session will shed some light about the recent scientific report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and how the finance sector can contribute to achieving some of the recommendations. We are very pleased today to have with us uh, Dr. Sylvie Kribel, coordinating lead author for the finance chapter in the 4th of April report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. Sylvie will tell us why financial choices are essential. Sylvie, the floor is yours. 
Th thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present some of the key messages of the uh, working group the um, results and the contribution uh, to the sixth assessment report. I only have three minutes, so it's of course a little bit tricky um, uh, to present the whole report, um, but I would like to encourage everyone to take a look at the website, uh, read through the summary for policymakers, which is not too difficult uh, to be understand and to get deeper into the finance chapter if you are interested in. This report is most likely or potentially the last one, which could still show the 1.5 pathway as a feasible one. So it's really now or never. Um, in 2019, uh, emissions were 12% higher than in 2010 and 54% higher than in 1990. So the emission growth has slowed down in the last decade, but we are still far away from a decarbonation um, uh, pathway, which would lead us to 1.5 or 2 degrees. Carbon emissions have increased in the last sector across all sectors. Um, and it's really important to always keep in mind that the, the emissions we have seen over the last decade, this is approximately what is uh, still here for as a carbon budget if we want to reach 1.5 degree. So it's not about a slow increase over the next years or until 2050. It's about very rapid and very significant reductions in the next years. But there is, of course, also some positive news. We see a growing number of countries committing to net zero emissions, not only countries, but also cities and regions. We have seen technology costs decreasing, um, and we see a significant dominance of renewables in many power systems across the globe. So this should give us some hope that this is feasible, and I will give you some more arguments uh, later on. To stress a little bit why it's so important that we see these deep cuts over the next years, um, let me talk shortly about the pathways. Um, so if we want to reach 1.5 degrees, we have to cut greenhouse gas and carbon emissions around half to 2030. We have to reduce also methane uh, emissions by a third, and we would need to reach net zero somewhere in the early 2050s. For a two degree uh, world, we would still have to reduce greenhouse gas and carbon emissions uh, by a quarter until 2030. So it's not about those emissions in many, many years. No, it's about the uh, emissions reductions in the next few years. We need to see a peak in global emissions before 2025. There is a significant gap between the even between the commitments in the national determined contributions uh, and what the, the current uh, regulations. So this has to be closed by governments. But when it comes to financial choices, we also talk about the stranded assets um, and the risk that assets will become stranded. Um, again, one number which I think is very tangible and should um, stress the importance of a wise investment decision. Emissions from currently existing, but also planned fossil fuel infrastructure alone, so excluding all other sectors, are higher than those consistent with limiting global warming to 1.5 degree. So here it's not only a moral imperative, but it's also an economic one and one which represents the massive systemic risk we see in the financial sector. There are also some positive news, of course, in the demand side alone could reduce end user uh, emissions by 40 to 70% in 2050. So the financial sector in future needs to focus much more on products and services rather than the um, emissions of the own operations of companies. Overall, technology costs have come down quite significantly over the past years. So we know that it's relatively cheap to reduce emissions and to deploy um, mitigation technologies, in particular in energy sector and in particular in transport. Approximately, we could half the emissions 
until 2030 at costs below $100 per ton. And this does not, or this compares very well um, to the costs we would see through climate change. So again, it's not only a moral imperative, but it's a rational choice to invest in mitigation and adaptation. The financial sector has made some progress. We see quite some significant momentum. Nevertheless, we don't see that reflected in the actual flows. Uh, climate finance flows are still heavily based on mitigation. Overall, they have increased by only 60% uh, between 2013 and 2040 and 2090 and 20. So we have to invest much more in uh, mitigation technology if we want to stick to 1.5 or 2 degree pathway, approximately by a factor of 3 to 6. So we need to increase uh, mitigation investments by a factor of 3 to 6 uh, to meet the average investment requirements between 2020 and 2030. There is a significant role for the financial sector to play. It will rise for the different sectors. In energy, it's more or less about a redirection of financial flows. Investments in the energy sector are as high as the requirements right now. We do not need additional sector allocations. Same in transport is an investment decision at the household level. It looks a little bit different in agri and in forests where we need more public financing, but still investors could play much more, uh, pay much more attention to uh, deforestation free value chains. This is something everyone could reflect in um, investment making decisions. It's not that the financial sector alone can address the overall misallocation of capital. There is a strong role to be played by the governments, but every investor can contribute and needs to contribute as much as he can if we want to stick to 1.5 or 2 degree. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Silvi. I am sure you have more to offer and there's more to say, uh, but you said it now or never, and we need to uh, do a lot before 2025, which is tomorrow, in fact. And it is not only moral, but also rational choices. This is what uh, goes to not only institutions, but also individuals. So we are also delighted to have with us Professor Christy Eby from the Department of Global Health, University of Washington, and IPCC author. Christy will tell us what the IPCC uh, findings are or mean for children. So Christy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Appreciate your interest in hearing what the IPCC has to say about the impacts of a changing climate on our health and well being. I understand the slide has far too many words, but there is a richness in the assessment. And just wanted to highlight in red some of the challenges we're already facing in a changing climate that people are suffering and in some cases dying from extreme heat events, food and waterborne diseases, vector borne diseases that have been attributed to a changing climate. There's also increases in zoonotic diseases, in mental health challenges, and in disruptions to our health services, particularly by events such as flooding. When we look across these climate sensitive health outcomes, we realize that about 85% of the health impacts of a changing climate are in children. So children are the most affected. I didn't put in the projections. The projections are that as temperature and precipitation patterns continue to change, that the challenges will continue to increase. And the extent to which they increase depends, as you just heard, on both adaptation and on mitigation. Just like with the climate sensitive health outcomes, there's a long list of effective adaptation options that can increase resilience today and into a changing future. The key is to strengthen the resilience of our health systems. We've seen dramatically during COVID how important it is to increase that resilience. But there are lots of other actions that can be taken. 
For example, heat wave early warning and response systems. Children are particularly affected by very high temperatures. Improving access to potable water. We know that that's a challenge today and will be exacerbated in a changing climate. There is a growing literature about mental health, including mental health in children and ensuring that we have the mental health services that are needed to help children when we have an extreme event, but also thinking about the issues with eco-anxiety that so many children are exhibiting around the world. We do need to ensure that we integrate whatever we do in health with what are called the upstream drivers of health in food, livelihood, social protection, infrastructure, water, and sanitation. The major challenge we have with implementing these options is the very, very limited investment. When you look at the investments under the UNFCCC in adaptation, less than a half a percent has gone to health. Similarly, there's many opportunities with mitigation. Most of the mitigation policies and technologies have significant benefits for health. When you quantify those benefits, they're of the same order of magnitude, if not larger, than the cost of mitigation. I use this example from the United States because it shows the economic benefits at a county level for avoided cases of child health outcomes from a greenhouse gas initiative. It reduces greenhouse gases in the Northeast. And you can see over the five years in some of the counties the cumulated value is millions of dollars. And those are lives that are improved, lives that are saved. We have so many opportunities to ensure that our children have healthy, have healthy lives and that they grow to their full potential. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to hearing the rest of the speakers. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, this is really enlightening. And, and uh, you know, you're saying the uh, uh, children are the most affected now and also in the future because they will be uh, handling the problems of today. And I'm I'm delighted that there is also an economic value of what you are uh, telling us. So uh, from the practical side that we are uh, delighted now to introduce uh, Mr. Renko Fisher. Renko is the climate change lead of the Unit Finance Initiative, who will enlighten us about what does finance sector leadership on climate change look like today. Renko, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Iyad, and uh, thank you also, uh, Professor Dr. Sauka Frederike, Fellow speakers, good to see you again, Sylvie and 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 Gunella and, and colleagues that I've worked uh, on these topics uh, in the past. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Yeah, I think the, the key question that we want to address here and that the statement um, uh, addresses is how the world's finance sector, so banks, investors, insurance companies, can and how they should and how they must actually become uh, not the the only actor, but a key enabler. Uh, perhaps also, you know, the, a key driving force behind uh, what uh, what what John Kerry and others call now World War Zero, which is the the the, the full decarbonization of the, the of the global economy uh, within the three decades that we have left to do that, or else, um, as we've just uh, heard, also uh, face the degree of of global heating that would disrupt the the foundations of of our life really. Uh, I think we, we need to ask that question around the finance sector, in part because everyone needs to contribute to the solutions here and to the decarbonization. Um, the, uh, 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 there's an absolute seriousness. As we all know, there's a sheer urgency. There's an existential threat that the climate change phenomenon confronts us with. But we also need to ask this question because of the nature and the power and the influence, of course, of financial institutions. They hold very often very large portfolios in those financial portfolios that reflect the entire economies of countries. And that makes them keenly interested often in the stability, at least log logically speaking, the theoretically speaking, it should make them interested 
in the stability and well-being of the entire system, the entire socioeconomic system, including also the environmental and climate system, as opposed to the well-being of one sector or one company over others. So I think there's a motivational element here uh, and an incentive structure for financial institutions that is interesting. And also, they have a lot of influence. They have all the influence that it takes to effectively engage the businesses, including greenhouse gas emitters that they lend to, that they invest in, um, um, many of which are, again, big uh, greenhouse gas emitters. And they have the influence and the power to effectively help engage governments that regulate those businesses and that regulate, of course, greenhouse gas emissions more broadly. Now, I think in the last few years, we have seen a surge in concern and proactivity by parts of the financial services system on climate change. Most of that action to date, though, has followed a somewhat, I would call, conventional logic uh, and desire among financial institutions to simply better understand the financial risks that this new climate change phenomenon uh, presents to them. So it's a little bit of a um, of, uh, uh, of a, 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 an approach to, to protect and create and in increase the, the resilience of their own portfolios. Um, in addition, though, um, we see now, as of the last three years, a rapidly increasing number of financial institutions that are going beyond that pure logic of just managing the financial risk that we're exposed that they're exposed to. Um, they're now embracing more of a logic of wanting to understand and reduce the greenhouse gas impacts that their portfolios and their holdings are having on the outside world. And they're doing that by committing and then as a result of that commitment, also setting near-term targets to align, to shift their portfolios and their totality uh, into alignment uh, with greenhouse gas pathways that would be considered to be consistent also with the long-term objective of the Paris Agreement, which is limiting uh, global heating to well below two degrees uh, by 2100 and ideally 1.5 degrees uh, by 2100. Um, and, and what's interesting is that those commitments that they're making their base and the targets that they're setting, they need to be based on the latest scientific knowledge that we have, as um, it has been compiled for, for many years now by the IPCC. So that's why we call these commitments and these targets for them, and that's the expectation, for them to be science-based. They need to set decarbonization targets for their portfolios that are informed by the science, as opposed to those targets coming out of thin air or just being aleatory. Now, this is a very new development, but it's and a new expectation that the world is raising, including us at UNEP vis-a-vis -vis financial institutions, but it is gaining traction and doing so very quickly. Only five years ago, I would say this was nowhere to be seen, this kind of ambition or this kind of new logic and approach to all of this. But already now, as UNEP, we're facilitating three very big large um, and large finance sector coalitions on net zero, one for institutional investors, pension funds, insurance companies, one for banks, commercial banks, and a third one uh, for insurance companies. And in those three alliances alone, there's now almost 200 financial institutions that have committed from developed countries, from developing countries to be doing all of what I've said, committing to transitioning portfolios and the emissions associated with those portfolios into alignment with the Paris Agreement, net zero emissions by 2050, but they're also committing to setting near-term targets every five years and their quantitative targets, emissions targets, and they're committing to, um, to reporting annually on the progress that they're making towards those targets. So at this point, you know, I, I do want to also highlight that everything that's happened, and Sylvia, I think, said it, it's promises. They're the right promises. I think they're the good quality pop promises that tick all of the boxes. But of course, we will have to see whether promises are, are kept. And one of the roles that we will play as UNFFI is, of course, ensure accountability among these alliances of finance sector players that these promises um, are uh, met. So that today is for us, this commitment to net zero at the total portfolio level coming from the top of the organizations with near-term operational targets, that's leadership. And it's, it's, it's happening, it's happening at some scale, uh, but we need many more financial institutions, of course, to come on board, to be part of this, the, the journey and the, the world's faith-based faith communities um, can be a great, very great, very powerful catalyst for that. That's why I want to conclude by thank you all in this space for your efforts 
and for helping us to amplify uh, the, the statement that recently was produced. Thank you very much and back over to you, Iyad. Thank you very much, uh, Remco. I have always thought that UNFI, not being biased because it's a UNEP initiative, but uh, really it brings hope and uh, brings the profit for the planet and the people. And I'm ha happy that you're starting the science-based targets, thinking and uh, implications or uh, applications in your uh, endeavor. So thank you very much. And I turn now the floor to my co-chair, Frederick, to take us to the second uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Iyad. Thank you, Zilvi, Christy, and Remco for your expertise. So in light of what has been shared, there is hope. There is hope, but only if every adult who cares about children uses the power that lays in climate responsible finance. Children cannot influence banks and pension funds. And this is why we developed with the United Nations Environment Program, the statement aimed at our financial service providers, launched on 9th of May. The appeal was co-signed by the leadership of the World Council of Churches, UNEP Finance Initiative, the Muslim Council of Elders, the New York Board of Rabbis, and the UNEP Faith for Earth Initiative. It is my great pleasure to now welcome Rabbi Potasnik, Vice Chair of the New York Board of Rabbis. So you are one of the co-signatories of the appeal. Rabbi Potasnik, yes. please tell us why this statement brings hope through concrete actions. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I bring you greetings from New York, which is the capital of the world. Uh, now it was Pope Francis who said that. So all those who disagree, all those who disagree, please take it up with him. Don't, don't argue with me. Uh, let me say this. We have a road in New York that leads to a bridge to another borough. It's the Belt Parkway that goes to the Verrazano Narrows Bridge that goes to Staten Island. In order to cross the bridge, you have to pass the faith chapels. And I think the message there is to all of us, if you wanna travel safely in this world, you better learn to travel together, all of the faiths together. Interestingly, in the story of creation on the third day of the week, which we would say would be Tuesday, God created the herbage, uh, the greens, the, the fruits, all of that. And after that was created, God said it was good. On the sixth day, when God created humans and reviewed his entire creation, he said it was very, very good. Why was it very good and not good? Because I think God saw the possibility that if humans would take a responsible position towards the earth, life could be not good, but very good. Because we are the entrusted caretakers. We have a responsibility to do everything we can to protect one another. That's why I urge everyone to sign that statement so we can say that we did something to further the cause. Uh, I uh, was talking to someone recently and he asked me this question. Why is it that the, the asthma rates are higher for children in poor areas? And I thought for a moment, and then I recognized that very often children in poor areas live in high risk environment areas. You don't see diesel trucks going through affluent areas. Some of the major problematic highways are built right near poor areas. In New York, we have what's called the Cross Bronx Expressway or the Deegan Expressway. And when you drive through there, you're saying, wait a minute, I'm contributing to pollution for people living around here. And when you look around here, I assure you, you're not going to find affluent areas. There is a sign uh, that I saw recently across from a cemetery which says the following, you never stand so tall as when you stoop to help a child. Now, that's a very, very, you know, wise statement. But why is it across from a cemetery? because maybe it's warning us 
if you don't stoop to help the child, if you don't do something for the for children, especially in the less you know less affluent areas, those in the high risk areas, then the alternative is not a very positive one. I recently attended a Quaker service and it was conducted in silence. And I said to someone, I wasn't familiar with the service, when does the service begin? He said to me, sir, it's when you walk out, that's when the real service begins. So all of us as faith leaders, we make all kinds of pronouncements in our respective houses of worship. But what matters is what we do. The service begins when we walk out and how we treat one another. We have a tradition in Jewish life. When a child is born, you're supposed to plant a tree. And years later, you take some of the branches and use them in the wedding canopy. Why do you plant a tree for a child? Because that child has to be cared for. That tree has to be cared for. So uh, I say to everyone here that years ago, there was a magazine called Life. After Life, there was a magazine called People. After People, there was a magazine called Us. And after Us, there was a magazine called Self. So we started with Life. We went to People. We went to Us. We went to Self. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, first, you start with Self, creation of Adam, creation of Eve. But then it's about us as one people who have to make life as meaningful as possible. I urge all of you to read what's called the Echo Bible. The Echo Bible tells you every day, do one thing to help you appreciate the environment. Look at the sun, walk in the, around the area, look at the trees, look at the birds, see the great blessings of this world and recognize that you have a responsibility to protect human life for all people. We are members of different faiths, but we belong to one human family. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rabbi Potasnik. Um, we are very grateful for your leadership on this initiative. Um, also, His Excellency Judge Abdel Salam um, was supposed to be here as the Muslim Council of Elders is also one of the co-signatories of the statement. His Excellency sends his regards as he is attending the inauguration of His Excellency President Ramos Horta in East Timor right now. But I use the occasion to share key excer excerpts from the statement. Um, so Walter, if you don't mind sharing the slide for, as uh, it helps to grasp in a nutshell what this appeal says, as we encourage you all to then consider endorsing it. So it says, we call upon our financial service providers to take urgent action and effective actions by investing in renewable energies and research for climate solutions, adopting a commitment to fully phase out financial services and exposure to coal, ending all financial investments towards any new oil and gas project explorations and extraction projects, requiring oil and gas companies to stop all new developments or expansion projects beyond this year, and if they have not done so yet, at least join the UN convened net zero asset owner, banking or insurance alliances. And furthermore, um, the statement urges our financial service providers to regularly report on progress, including um, intermediate targets, at least every five years. And most importantly, here's the message to you, our dear participants in this webinar. We invite all members of our constituencies and all of our partners to do likewise. When you decide to endorse the statement, it would be wonderful if you let us know by sending a message to this address and also put up the statement on your web page and share it as much as you can for people to act upon it. 
Now I'm delighted to introduce youth activist Kaya George from Canada. Kaya, you are a Tzlail Batuth nation member and a Tulalip tribes member. Kaya, your testimonial will help to understand why, why climate responsible finance is one of the most urgent child protection measures of today. Over to you, Kaya. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to continue my formal introduction in my traditional um, indigenous language. Hot Skoil Tnoya, Pathly a Queen Kashamin, Kai George Queen Sna, Tinachin Kla da Khwelip, Tinachin Kla Slay with the Snatch. I just said hello, everybody. My name is Kaya George. I come from the Slay with Nation and Tulilip tribes. and. I am currently in San Pancho, Mexico. So I apologize ahead of time for any distractions, any noises. There's many birds here. Um, there's many animals that make noises as well. Um, as I said, my name is Kaya George. I come from Sotooth Nation and that is located in what is now called North Vancouver, Canada. I have been fighting against the Trans Mountain Pipeline for more than half of my life. Um, I'm 23 years old and I started speaking out against the pipeline, which comes from the Alberta tar sands, which are oil sands the size of France, located in the center of Canada, one of the biggest industrial projects on the planet. I started speaking out against this when I was 11 or 12 years old. Um, there are many reasons why I started fighting alongside my family, but I remember the day my father came to me and said they want to build a pipeline and it's gonna end in our territory, in our sacred homelands, and it'll stop at a refinery located directly across from my nation and, um, and right on the Burrard Inlet, which is our most holy place on the planet and the place of our creation, the place we love the most and we get our food from and we travel on and we do our ceremonies in. He said, they say this is gonna bring economic opportunity, but I think we know better. And I think this is, could po cause potential destruction for not only our community, but all of the communities surrounding us in Vancouver. And so for all these reasons and many more, we say no, we say it was a 100% consensus no as a nation. And that is why not only did I decide to say no, but I decided to speak out against it not just for my future, but for my little brother's future and for all the children future who were younger than me and the children who are yet to come. So at around 11 or 12, I started speaking out and traveling. Um, I also wanna say I'm happy to speak my language, which I had to learn in university because at one point my people were punished for doing so. My grandmother went to residential school um, knowing her language with a sense of pride for who she was and came out traumatized and brutalized and she was from the age of 14 abused in many ways and these schools where children were typically forcibly removed from their homes and put in um, was put on by the Canadian government and the Catholic Church to destroy everything that made it my people who we are so I believe that there is a lot of efforts that should be taken into protecting our children and to protecting our culture. And um, ironically, the little bit of language and traditions and beliefs that remained that my grandmother and many elders held on to, despite that, despite those injustices and horrible abuses committed against them, um, are what is leading the climate justice fight in Vancouver. Our beliefs in sacred laws of having a reciprocal and loving relationship with the land and water and treating the land and water as if it was a loved one is what's guiding us throughout this entire fight. And it's why we fight so hard to protect what we love because it's everything to us. And Slay with Tooth directly translates to people of the inlet. So we would do anything to protect what we love the most and to look at, at that water is to the same way. I feel the same love when I look at my grandmother and that is why we must protect her. And that is why we must do anything we can to protect her and, and, and speak and educate people and develop relationships and partnerships with people to do this. Because um, to protect and love the land is to protect and love everything that ever has been and everything that ever will be in existence. And this is a universal idea of love. And 
is it's our guiding force and the reason why we fight so hard. And it's the reason why the energy company Kinder Morgan, who once owned the pipeline, dropped it in 2017 due to public backlash, much of which coming from my small nation of just 500 people and many tens of thousands of Vancouverites and allies and many people from all different walks of life and all different ages, shapes, forms, and who came and used their voice to stand up with us. Much of the environmental fight is youth led. And we see as a solution forward to look at indigenous rights and um, environmental rights, rights is completely intertwined. Because when you think about it, indigenous people make up 5% of the Earth's population, but hold 80% of the world's biodiversity. And that's to say my nation isn't necessarily anti business, we're anti destruction of the planet. We have many partnerships and consultations with sustainable businesses and organizations. Um, but the important part to us is proper communication and con consultation, no matter what. And I want to end with um, talking about an experience I had many years ago when I was in high school. I spent many years traveling around the globe and advocating and speaking out for my future and the future of humanity and the planet. I can recall a specific conference um, I was speaking at in high school and I remember speaking with a woman there and she asked how I was and I said I'm quite tired because I just finished a panel and I just got off of my flight um, late last night and I spent a lot of my day out in action but now I have to do homework and um, this is a routine for me I would often travel and I would often speak and I would I would do homework during the night and um, a lot of a lot of my extracurricular activities I had to give up. I was also president of, at the club at a club at my school and I was also on the tennis team. Um, but being a kid didn't even occur to me while doing these things. I gave up a lot of my my teen years and my childhood in the climate fight and I know I'm not alone. I know many, many youth and it's it's amazing and it's admirable that many youth are standing up for the the planet because it's our futures at stake and we do face a lot of eco anxiety because even in my short lifetime i've seen much changes in the planet and now know too much to ever not want to fight for the planet and so a lot of this pressure is put on us and a lot of this fear is put on us because we fear for our futures and that's why a lot of youth fight so hard but it can't just be on us i remember the woman looking at me in that moment and saying I'm sorry and I said I said what are you sorry for and it's okay like um and she said I, I'm sorry that we're the ones my generation she was I think in her 40s or 50s she said my generation's the one who caused this and you're the ones that have to pick up the pieces and you're the ones having to put all the pressure on you and I said it's okay because you're doing something now and maybe you didn't know then and she said but we knew and we knew and we didn't do anything we knew the destruction that was taking place and we didn't do anything. And now it's a lot of young people and whose futures are at stake and they're risking their education and a lot of the time their lives so that they can protect the planet for all of us and the planet for the next generations and for your future. And I don't think I'll forget the look in her eyes when she said that, that something could have been done. And I can't imagine looking at my younger brother or in many years, a young person and saying I didn't do anything. And so I hope you can all take something away from this, no matter how small, you have the chance to say you did something when it mattered. We owe it to our children and young people to do what we can to protect their futures and our futures with the decisions we make today. And I believe a lot of that as was said earlier, um, a lot of that, we, we can make a lot of decisions where we put our money and where we, we decide to invest. And a lot of the time, young people don't have the resources quite yet to do that. So this starts with a lot of people here today and a lot of the older generations who look out for many young people in our futures. And so I thank you and I hope these words fall into the right ears and the right hearts. I hope this in a kind and gentle way and um, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you all for listening to my words and hope that they landed in some shape or form. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kaya. And yes, the WCC and member churches in Canada are actively engaged in addressing the atrocities caused by churches in the past, which your grandmother was a victim of. 
Now, the statement shared earlier was inspired by good practices of WCC members who managed <clears throat> to influence decisions of their banks and pension funds. One of these champions is with us today. It's Gunella Hahn, representing the Church of Sweden, Head of Sustainable Investment. Over to you, Gunella. Thank you, Frederik. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me to this very important webinar uh, and to talk about uh, and share our experiences from um, our way of, of trying to influence uh, the financing industry. Uh, we are um, pretty small asset owner in Sweden, but still a billion euro uh, under management. And uh, uh, we wanted to use our voice to do whatever we could do to move the needle. So um, apart from uh, divesting from coal, oil and gas in uh, 2008, uh, quite early, uh, like five years before the divestment movement, uh, we also tried um, to influence other fund managers and asset owners and asset managers to do the same. So um, we divested from uh, both an ethical point of view and also a financial point of view. And then we wanted to invest in the solutions instead, like energy efficiency and um, natural uh, renewable energy sources. And uh, at that time, we couldn't find actually any funds that were able to invest uh, in, according to our new climate policy. So, but then they started to change. So they also uh, changed their funds, the content of their funds, the portfolio, and got rid of actually the fossil companies and included more solution oriented companies. So that was. Uh, an effect that we had on the, on the financial industry in Sweden, but also I would say outside Sweden because we are also a global investor. And uh, at that time, um, they were quite hesitant, but with time, I guess, and also with the Paris Agreement, uh, uh, it all changed. So today it's very easy to find funds and fund managers that don't want to invest in, in the problem with fossil fuels, they want to be uh, leaning to the future and the solutions. So that's very positive. And I think that we had a, uh, yeah, we played a part there in, in, in Sweden at least uh, to convince the, uh, the fund managers that this is the new way to go, the path to go forward. And I was invited to many different uh, stakeholders or actors within the financial community, so from from uh, banks to fund managers to municipalities that had assets, uh, universities and and fund managers overall that really wondered, is it is it really safe to do this? How, didn't it cost you a lot of money? And I said, no, there are so many other companies to invest in. Uh, that was the truth, and it was also a lot riskier uh, portfolio we got when we divested from these very volatile. Uh, stocks, they, they change very much in, in, in valuation and in price. So we got a more stable portfolio and uh, with less risks of stranded assets and, and you know use well, which is assets that risk to lose their their uh, the value, right? Uh, so I think we were early on in that process, and and um, and then the other part how we want to. Um, influence our our peers and uh, the investment community is really to to engage with the banks or fund managers that we are already involved with that we have business with for instance one of the largest banks in sweden we found out that they actually financed fossil fuel companies to some quite a small but still extent uh, they were actually the largest bank in Sweden, which is nothing compared to American banks. Uh, but in, since um, in Sweden we don't have really oil and, and these fossil fuel assets, so. <clears throat> but we we arranged a meeting with the CIO, no, the CEO, the top of the top, in this bank, and he gladly wanted to see us, 
and uh, I had my three layers of bosses, and uh, and he had there were this bank had also four layers of of of, <laughs> of people um, that discussed together uh, on their engagement in the fossil fuel sector, and we were very clear to them that we couldn't see a future relationship without feeling confident that they were doing their part and and stopped their financing in fossil fuels you know they had relationships with some fossil fuel companies and we wanted them to terminate the contracts basically some time and we wanted them to be clear on what the phase out period would how long it would be and if they would declare officially uh, that they were going to you know leave the fossil fuel sector of course it's a very sensitive issue they had it's their clients and they make money from these clients but and but we wanted to be clear uh, to them that you if you are to be proud of your own climate uh, position and you say you want to be paris aligned uh, with one hand you cannot with the other hand continue to finance the sector that has to be you know come down to zero so we had a very it was a very pleasant meeting uh, they got our point and this was a year ago and now we are about to follow up uh, what has happened and uh, i think it's very important uh, for them to hear from us an important client of theirs that we want them to do this because it would make it easier for them to continue to take the right step forward so I guess that's uh, the story behind how important it is to use the voice you have because you've had always a voice. How little money you could have with your on your bank account, or that you're an insurance client, you can always talk to these people. That oh, how are you investing your 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 capital, your assets in in your asset management department or in your credit department? And I don't want to be a client if you're not trying to become uh, Paris aligned. So just to start that conversation, I think that could make them also um, more um, uh, encouraged to, to drive this uh, work forward. So if anyone one wants to hear more about this, you're, you are welcome to contact me later on. Thank you very much. Very encouraging indeed. Uh, thank you, Gunella. Now, with everything that was shared so far and on the challenges and solutions, there may be questions from our panelists. Uh, Iyad, have you been able to watch out for questions possibly in the chat box? I mean, we are running behind time, so we don't have so much time for questions right now. There will be a longer part later for discussion, but tell me, Iyad, could you see some questions? So I, I see one question from Joy Kennedy. And Joy is asking, how can we motivate and encourage the seniors in our congregations to engage uh, with pension funds, banks, and insurance companies from their own faith perspective? What resources can we bring to make this shift in understanding and actions? So perhaps, Gunella, would you like to answer this question? Could you please repeat it? How can we motivate and encourage seniors in our congregations to engage with pension funds, banks, insurances from their own faith perspective? Regarding resources, by the way, I've put some in the chat box, also those which Punella referred to me earlier, like the Fair Finance Guide, etc. So the question for you is maybe from your experience, how would you tell Joy Kennedy, how can you motivate and encourage the seniors in the congregations to do this engagement, which Church of Sweden has been so successful in. Okay, uh, thank you. I think you can do it um, uh, from different angles. One is the ethical, of course, perspective that we have. <laughs> uh, we want to protect uh, our future, and uh, this is the right thing to do. Uh, to 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 just really um, as quickly as we can, because we are. Uh, in big problems uh, to to do the transition the climate transition and uh, 
and the finance, the, the pension funds, funds at least, I think they are all aware of it. Uh, so they need to hear from their clients that, that this is the way they should do, go. And it's also from a financial point of view that it will cost a lot of money if we don't do this. And it will be very costly for all of us. So it's to pr protect value, but also to uh, do the right thing. And I think thank you, you can- yeah. And thank you, Joy, for this question and, and do try. Uh, this is really worth it and amazing success stories have been shared with us. So do whatever you can to do this. And besides endorsing the appeal launched on 9th of May, there are many other solutions to ensure your money is not undoing all the good work that you are doing. Over to you, Iyad, for this next session. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick, and thank you everybody who spoke in this uh, important session. And we have learned a lot from uh, you. Uh, now, the session, the title of this session is Inspiring Ways of Walking the Talk. And this actually responds to Joy's question, how can we motivate senior leaders in our churches and mosques and synagogues and what have you, um, which is walking the talk. And uh, some of you or most of you know, and some of you have actually participated in the 2021 uh, meeting at the Vatican, where a, uh, a, an interfaith statement to COP26 was submitted to the president of COP26 and was held by the Vatican, the UK government, and the Italian governments. And it was a long discussion or process uh, of seven months uh, between faith leaders and scientists to come to this statement, which was, uh, I believe, uh, very balanced. Uh, it showed what we want from the international community, but also what we promise as faith uh, leaders uh, to do uh, from our own uh, part. Um, a few weeks later, after the 4th of October, uh, we also held another a global meeting for the 40 plus uh, faith leaders who have attended the meeting to take stock of what has happened, what are the reflections on COP26 and what needs to be uh, done. Uh, so this session actually contributes to uh, that. What can be done? What are the examples and how have we handled uh, this statement and taking it uh, forward? So we are delighted to have with us uh, today, Reverend Fletcher, uh, Fletcher Harper, Executive Director of Green Faith, and uh, to talk about the initiative they have recently launched with the World Council of Churches that contributes to fulfilling this call. Uh, Father Fletcher, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Iyad. Great to see everyone. Um, and I'll be brief, and I'm, I'm here speaking um, with appreciation for uh, this opportunity and for um, the initiative that we're working on with the World Council of Churches, with Hindus for Human Rights, with the Islamic Society of North America, with Laudato Si movement, with Operation NOAA, Faith for the Climate Network. And what I would say, um, at the risk of seeming too much like a blunt New Yorker, is that it would be a huge mistake if we concluded as people of faith and religious leaders that um, adding our name to a statement is enough. Um, we represent grassroots and work with grassroots faith communities around the world. Um, these grassroots faith communities are experiencing the kinds of climate impacts that Kaya referred to, um, polite uh, diplomatic engagement <clears throat> has some place, but needs now to be joined consistently by very firm, very clear public action to put pressure on the world's major banks and asset managers. Because absent that kind of pressure, change will not happen anywhere close to the speed that's required. This coming Wednesday is the annual shareholders meeting of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager. Uh, a group of grassroots people of faith will be gathering 
outside of BlackRock's headquarters to pray and to take direct public action to call on BlackRock to immediately end its new investments in the fossil fuel sector and deforestation to make sure that the companies BlackRock invests in have a serious commitment to protecting indigenous rights and to make sure that the default options that BlackRock provides to its clients meet these bold but necessary climate standards. Um, the time for um, solely uh, secondhand engagement ended about a decade ago. We must, as religious leaders, summon the courage to speak very directly and very clearly with our financial managers and with the banks and asset managers that are responsible for shepherding our funds. The example of the Church of Sweden is extraordinarily important. For a sustained period of time, um, that faith community has engaged directly and unequivocally and has been willing to take action based on what they see. We need the same kind of sustained public pressure, which research and experience has taught all of us is the only thing that creates change. Um, we'll be working on these types of actions um, increasingly in collaboration with many of you in the future. And I urge us all to take the very important points captured in the statement that we're all endorsing and celebrating today and to put the full power of our moral energy behind them just as we would if our children's lives hung in the balance. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Father Fletcher. Uh, the work of Green Faith has been appreciated by many and you are leading by example and we do need to keep the pressure. Um, it's been a pleasure to meet uh, some um, high level faith leaders and it's uh, a pleasure to welcome again, uh, Professor Ramathan, Ramanathan, uh, council member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences at the Vatican. And as uh, we said, the uh, focus of the COP26 interfaith meeting was on linking science and uh, religions or faith. So, uh, Professor Ramanathan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here. I want to report on two activities <clears throat> we are involved in. First, I'm a professor at University of California. So we have started a, a major uh, education uh, initiative for the private sector, primarily CEOs and financials, et cetera. So there's a team of about uh, seven of us, including climate scientists, Nobel laureates in economics, uh, business uh, professors. And we're gonna be releasing this education program uh, in July. It's basically a set of total of two hours of lectures conveying the urgency and the need for the private sector to invest in this. And uh, like I said, it's going to be launched in July. The second effort I wanna report on, let me give you a preface of what we are trying to do. In about eight to 13 years, that's 2030 to 2033, uh, the climate system is gonna cross the one and a half degree warming threshold even if all of our mitigation efforts we heard today succeeds, we are gonna pass that threshold because it's already on that track. The system has already warmed close to 1.2 degrees. What that means is that uh, the climate and the extreme weather is gonna keep getting worse and worse and worse, at least for the next 20 years. So while the mitigation has to continue, we have lost the luxury of depending just on mitigation. So we have to talk about adaptation on a major scale and build resilience uh, to humanity. All of us are going to suffer, but two groups. First is it comes under this intergenerational equity and intragenerational equity. This meeting is all about intergenerational equity. Generations to come who had nothing to do with this emissions are gonna suffer the worst consequences. The second aspect is intragenerational. 
in the world, there is now what I call the poorest 3 billion or the bottom 3 billion as far as the energy that is concerned. Their total emission is less than 5%. While the wealthiest 1 billion have contributed more than 50%. And the worst consequences are going to be suffered by this poorest 3 billion, mainly living in villages, least developed countries, South Asia, Africa, etc. So, as Pope Francis said, the cry of the earth has to be heard with the cry of the poor. So, we, 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 there needs a massive effort to build this resilience against humanity, particularly those who are at least to do with this. So at the Pontifical Academy of Science, we report directly to Pope Francis. We are starting this initiative, uh, building resilience against climate stress. So we're gonna have the first meeting is in July. It, that's mainly scientific experts. Based on the outcome of that, uh, after uh, listening to uh, the amazing uh, presentations uh, this morning from this uh, World Council of Church and this interfaith uh, effort started by Professor Ayat Abamogi from UNAP, uh, I will uh, approach the uh, Vatican to bring in this interfaith uh, activities to this resilience. Our hope is we could, uh, the Vatican would take this message to the next uh, IPCC in, uh, which is gonna happen this year. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Ramathan. And, and uh, we would very much appreciate your efforts as we have always appreciated it. And uh, as you are saying, we are living and we will continue whatever measures we take we will continue to, le to live under the conditions of climate change and we need to know how to adapt to it. Um, always when climate change is mentioned, uh, at least to me, uh, the Pacific region comes to mind as the most uh, vulnerable region in the world. So to know more about this, uh, we have with us Reverend James uh, Bagwan, the General Secret Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches. Uh, Reverend James, the floor is yours. Thank you, yeah, just checking that you can hear me. Very well, so. Excellent. Yes, Nisam Bulavinaka and warm uh, Pacific greetings from uh, Fiji, where it is um, just after two o'clock on Saturday morning. And um, being ahead of the rest of the world time-wise, we're used to seeing the rest of the world catch up. And that's why for us, we often hear, we're used to um, hearing the terms specific time, Fiji time, island time. But we are ahead of much of the world also in the impacts of climate change, the impacts of ongoing disregard for the result of uh, unceasing carbon emissions into our sky and uh, into our ocean. We continue to experience the impacts of not only investment in, but subsidies for the fuel, uh, the fossil fuel industry. And in this time of fuel prices increasing due to the conflict in uh, Ukraine, my question is, does the profit margin remain the same? Because the cost we're paying is more than dollars or euro. It is in the lives of our children. And while armed conflict is the security issue in the global north and in many, in many other places, for us here in the Pacific, our children see climate change as a human security issue. Here we talk about food security. We talk about environmental security. In the first four verses of Psalm 24, we read, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear falsely. It's quite interesting that this phrase, the earth is the Lord's and everything is it, and everything in it, is um, on the topmost uh, facade of the London Stock Exchange. 
um, and I find that quite uh, quite disturbing, um, particularly from a, a decolonization point of view, when so much exploitation of the environment and of people um, um, for finance for for profit had taken place in this place. But um, dear friends, now is the time for the banking and finance institutions, for investors to clean their hands, as the Psalm says, to clean their hearts of the carbon equivalent of bloodstains which are found in the rising seas, which are found in the saltwater intrusions into our plantations, into our homes, on dying and dead coral in rapidly acidifying oceans and communities destroyed by extreme weather events, cyclones and hurricanes increasing in intensity and in fury, floods and droughts which uproot communities, forcing them into exile from their homes, from the places where their umbilical cords are buried under the trees. And at the same time, we are being pressured to allow investment that threatens to destroy what is left of our oceans through deep sea mining. Our people's spirituality, their faith is connected to land and ocean, to the oikos, to creation, both seen and unseen. And we cannot be forced to put at risk our children's future because of the desire for profit in the present. We cannot put our need for climate finance ahead of the need to ensure that such finance causes more suffering of planet and people. So as we call for divestment from the fossil fuel industry, we also call for a just transition so that the most vulnerable in our already vulnerable communities, our children may not just survive, but flourish in a way that allows the land and the ocean of which we are a part to also flourish. We call on you and we call on those that you uh, uh, a part of your communities, communities of faith and uh, communities uh, wherever you may be, to invest in the future of the planet, invest in the future of our children. And we ask you on behalf of our children in the Pacific, what kind of ancestors will you be? Anaka, thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend James. And uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know how anybody can go to bed and sleep at night knowing that uh, some nations will cease to exist because of climate change. So thank you very much. Um, we also are honored to have with us Dr. Har Harold Hunter, representative of the Pentecostal World Fellowship and International Pentecostal Holiness Church Ecumenical Officer. So, uh, Dr. Harold, the floor is yours. Thank you, moderator. I would like to offer this morning a prayer of confession. The gospel according to St. Luke 19.8 is where we have Zacchaeus saying he will give half of all of his possessions to the poor. But importantly, he adds, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. The book of Acts 19, 11, and 12 declares, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that when handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched their skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them. My Pentecostal church used Luke 19, 8 to defend a teaching that they called restitution where possible. We would then turn to Acts 19, 11, and 12 to amplify mediated forms of grace when seeking healing of the physical human body. Classical Pentecostal self-perception is that they were 150 years old with an explosion of growth in the 21st century led by a diverse group of men and women in the global South. When it comes to advocates for climate justice in the US, the leading voices come from the majority African-American churches of God in Christ. Any of you that have followed the news here in the United States about the slaughter of innocents in a grocery store in Buffalo, you may not have known that many of those men and women were leaders in the local Church of God in Christ. The most influential prophetic activists fighting climate change are to be found among indigenous Pentecostals in Ecuador, Brazilian Pentecostal women advocating for the Amazon, echo farming Pentecostals in the Philippines, seeking to mitigate famine and the pandemic, 
while Ghanaian Pentecostals are investing in one million trees. The Pentecostal movement is at a Kairos moment where they must seek forgiveness for being captive to an alien dispensational eschatology that sees no value in healing the planet, which we have been destroying. Our prayer, prayer claws that are anointed with oil for physical human healing need to become investment strategies that empower our marginalized brothers and sisters who suffer disproportionately from climate change. Pentecostals have affirmed that restitution extends to the issues of racism and sexism. Pentecostals in the global north need to work toward a Zacchaeus model of restitution that offers a fourfold investment of funds, particularly for the investment of environmental racism, particularly women. Investments in fossil fuels must give way to working for an economy of flourishing for all peoples. Pentecostals revere their ancestors and seek to make straight the path for the generations that follow. The hour has come to repent, reform, in order to restore all of God's creation. I offer this prayer with humility to be considered in a seminar that I've organized on climate justice at the Pentecostal World Conference this October, hosted by the Yoido Full Gospel Church and a Brunin at the World Council of Churches General Assembly this September, as we continue our search for partners. May God's name be blessed. Back to you, moderator. Amen, and thank you, Dr. Harold. And, and I believe we do need to seek forgiveness uh, from our creator for the sake of our grandchildren who have not yet been bo uh, born and who will uh, suffer the consequences of our actions. So thank you everybody. Thank you for all the speakers in this session. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I don't see any questions uh, typed on the chat. Uh, so if you have a question, kindly type. Uh, I know we are uh, behind the time. <laughs> so maybe we could skip this uh, question and answer and go back to you, Frederic. Thank you. Yes, thank you for all these amazing examples which were shared. Now, if someone has only 10 minutes to deal with this, here's a powerful tool for anyone who cares about children's future. It is a letter template, which you can customize very quickly by inserting the contact details of your bank, pension fund, or insurance. It is available in four languages on our webpage. For the UNEP Finance Initiative resources, so Walter, you may share the slide six. They are in the annex of our joint statement, but you also find these resources here on this slide. Both the letter which was just shared is there and the resources. And Asmaira, maybe you can put this all in the chat box so that people don't miss and spread the word about these very powerful tools for everyone. Over to you, Iyad, to open our discussion, building on the collective wisdom of the distinguished guests present in this panel. Thank you, Frederic. Um, and in, uh, in respect of time, I uh, see that uh, Dahlia uh, with us. I would like to ask Dahlia if uh, she wants to make an intervention of one or two minutes of the uh, call that you have made uh, in New York uh, for the moral responsibility in the finance sector. Uh, are you there, Dahlia? I'm here. Hopefully you can hear me coming through. Thumbs up if I'm coming through. Perfect. Yes. 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 <laughs> Hello everyone and greetings from New York. I am Dahlia Rakowitz with Dainu, a Jewish call to climate action. And it's a real privilege to be joining you across space and time and hear about all this inspiring work. Dainu is building a multi-generational Jewish climate movement that is taking bold action rooted in spiritual audacity. And in just a few seconds, I will share a video of 21 actions that Jewish leaders across the country planned outside of the banks and asset managers that are funding the climate crisis. 
we feel at Dainu that we need to take to heart the Jewish imperative to continue Lador Vador from generation to generation. So in line with the statement and all of your important work, we are facing down the existential threat of the climate crisis that could interrupt our ability to, to continue Lador Vador. And we know that we need to be bringing all of our power, all of our might to face down the financial institutions that are perpetuating the climate crisis by giving their money to fossil fuels. We also need to make sure that our policymakers are not finding the easy way out in the face of an energy crisis caused by the war in Ukraine. We see in the United States the call for more oil, draft, oil and gas drilling and mining and exporting that dirty, polluting energy abroad. So I will also share in the chat an event that we are hosting, Interfaith Action, a moral call, call for peace and climate justice that's taking place this Sunday in person in New York City and live streamed to a global audience that is gonna be sharing different perspectives from faith traditions and calling on our policymakers to take urgent action. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dahlia. Um, before giving the floor to two questions that I have on the chat, I would like to give the floor to David, director of the Make you, My Money uh, Matter uh, initiative to have one minute, please, to talk about the initiative. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the wonderful speakers today. Um, I, you know, we've talked a lot about the role of financial institutions, but our campaign, Make My Money Matter, is working to empower individual savers, uh, pension holders, savers, bank account holders to take control of their money. We know that the majority of people around the world want their money to be building a better world, to be tackling the climate crisis, to be investing for people and for planet but too often those voices are not heard. So we set up our campaign in the UK to help educate people about the power of their money and empower them to drive change on their pension funds, on their banks. And we're feeling that if you put the role of the consumer, of the saver, at the heart of these investment decisions, you can move the trillions of pounds invested through our financial institutions. And I would just echo the in critical role of, of kind of individual action of people showing how much they want their money to matter for their pension funds and their bank and the key role that can play. Thank you very much for uh, the very brief and very informative uh, uh, intervention. I um, uh, have two questions or two uh, distinguished uh, uh, friends. Uh, Cathy uh, is asking, well, uh, uh, something with multiple areas or multiple um, uh, perspectives. One of them is how do we uh, ensure that the financial institutions do listen to uh, faith organizations in their moral imperative or uh, seriousness? And I, I believe, uh, you know, the weight, the wealth of uh, faith investment institutions, which is the fourth largest investment power on earth, if we do actually just uh, tell our banks that we will stop investing in your banks and your financial institutions, that will make a change. So we have to take the first step. Um, as the uh, question itself has many aspects, so I will leave that uh, probably to uh, be answered by everybody in the, um, in the document that we are collecting. I would like to give the floor to uh, my dear friend Chris uh, Ferguson for a, a minute or two of intervention. Please, uh, Chris. Yes, thank you very, very much. Uh, I just want to uh, very quickly uh, zoom out of the framework, picking up some of the things that James and others have said in the uh, statement of the interfaith leaders that the focus wasn't uh, exclusively on transformation of, of finances in terms of guaranteeing the future of the children, but also on the absolute transformation of the economic system and creating new narratives of development. So I would uh, also urge uh, us to uh, continue to embrace and look at uh, the uh, initiatives within the World Council of Churches and the uh, World Community Reform Churches and other faith communities that are directly 
uh, address the transformation of the uh, economic system itself and the um, and the transformation of the architecture. So not only uh, the institutions that work within, uh, I think, um, uh, a capitalist system that is not uh, functioning for the well-being of people and planet, but the transformation of that system itself. And I would call for our future action and these kinds of things to make stronger connections uh, between the work we're doing for economic transformation and uh, financial uh, uh, transformation. And I think the uh, Herald's uh, input uh, was very uh, clear uh, about the Zacchaeus model. And for instance, uh, the, were, uh, there is a group of uh, ecumenical actors, uh, including the World Council of Churches, involved in promoting a tax justice um, uh, initiative uh, uh, called the, Z the Zacchaeus tax. And uh, together with this, other initiatives uh, for uh, uh, economies of life. I uh, am uh, currently uh, the chancellor of a group of 16 Latin American Protestant uh, universities that are gearing uh, their entire research and, um, and um and teaching models uh, towards contributions towards a sustainable um, development goals, transforming our, in fact, the, the idea of our religious contribution to our educational institutions to change Thank the you. paradigm to economic transformation. So Thank sorry you, for Chris. taking time. Thank you. The message is very clear. Organizations money, religious communities money, citizens money, we need everyone to take the step for our children. The solution is in our hands. And as Mayra will put on the chat box, a very important drive for you all. This was created for you to please insert there on the next steps, what you are doing to translate this into action so that we can share the collective wisdom and move together into the only possible direction of a livable future. The slide, Walter. Um, so thank you very much. And please get in touch with us if you need any further clarifications. I'm so sorry we have to wrap up um, the slide with the um, trees. <laughs> OK, this is the um, Google Drive. Uh, very important, if you can please all insert your information into this Google Drive, because then we stay connected, we build on each other's experience, and we create really a movement that will accelerate the solutions right away. We have not a minute to waste. Thank you, Frederick, and I believe uh, I would add my voice that this document is very important. In fact, to uh, test and monitor where we have been doing good. Uh, we, uh, the World Council of Churches and all of our partners, uh, we will be thinking of an event on the 4th of October, which is the um, anniversary of holding the interfaith uh, uh, statement at the Vatican to review uh, these contributions and probably publish uh, something that holds your success story. So, Thank you very much. Um, all the best from our side. And let's keep the pressure. Let's keep, uh, keep the action. Thank you very much. And all the best. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Iyad. And let's keep the hope through actions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.